When Kate Middleton married Prince William, she took her place on the global stage. Overnight, she became one of the biggest stars of the most famous family in the world. Then, just over two years after marrying the future king, the Duchess of Cambridge swiftly cemented her own place in royal history, giving birth to their first child and third in line to the throne, Prince George Alexander Louis. He's got a good pair of lungs on him, that's for sure. Uh, he's, uh, he's a big boy, he's quite heavy. And only 18 months after the birth of their first child, news broke around the world of another addition to the royal household. I'm going to become an uncle again for the second time, hopefully. So, um, yeah, it's um, very exciting news. As their newborn daughter is welcomed into the family, those select few with the inside track on Kate and William reveal what impact their new child will have on them as parents of modern royals. New parents inside the royal family are given an awful lot of latitude, more than you might think. How will these high-profile, hands-on parents cope with two young children to look after? Queen's been pregnant four times, she's had four children. She knows exactly what Kate is going through. It's a time that is incredibly challenging. You are juggling so many different things, but particularly if you're the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, let's face it, this is the most photographed, famous royal couple in the world. I think if they still feel under siege at Kensington Palace, we will see them more and more living in their very big house in the country that the Queen has given them. And what clues lie in the past that may well determine the royal future for their daughter? In many cases, some of the greatest monarchs in British history were never supposed to wear the crown. Since becoming the Duchess of Cambridge and mother to the future king, Kate Middleton's life has dramatically changed forever. She wasn't an aristocrat. At. She wasn't blue-blooded. She was a regular home counties girl. And look at her now. For years, the media has been looking for a, a new golden goose. And since Diana died, they haven't been able to find one. In Kate Middleton, Duchess of Cambridge, they've got a new golden goose. The royal family don't see themselves as celebrities. That's not how they class themselves. And it's very interesting at an A-list event in Hollywood where William and Kate were, when you see genuine A-list celebrities queuing up to speak. William and Kate. That's the level we're talking at here. I think no matter where you are in the world, A, you know who Kate is, and B, you've definitely Googled to find out where you can get your hands on that dress. She's hugely popular, both here in the United Kingdom, overseas in Australia and the States. She is a role model, she's a fashion icon, and I think that's very simply because she was an ordinary girl from Berkshire, who happened... The intense spotlight of being a high-profile royal is relentless. From what designer she chose for her wedding gown, the historic event that was Prince George's birth, to her public royal duties and charitable endeavours, Kate has dealt with it all, seemingly, with ease. She may be a swan, she may be paddling furiously underneath, but to the world, she seems uh, imperturbable. <laughs> A few days after Prince George's first birthday, William and Kate visited the Tower of London, with only a select few privy to the exciting news that baby number two was already on the way. And one of my sources said to me, watch this space, because they do want another child, it's not going to be far off. The rest of the world was let in on the news a few weeks later when Clarence House took to Twitter on September the 8th to announce that the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge were expecting their second child. The reaction to the news that uh, Kate was pregnant again was, again, one of surprise because it was a very early announcement. They didn't want to announce it that early, but they had to because she had had to cancel an engagement. The royals never cancel, so when they do, you know something's up. But with the return of the extreme form of morning sickness she endured while pregnant with Prince George, Kate wasn't able to fully enjoy the news. Acute morning sickness is called hyperemesis gravidarum. That's the medical terminology for it. Morning sickness is very, very common in the first three months of pregnancy, but a smaller group of women will have such severe morning sickness that they get dehydrated, they feel very unwell, and they are unable to go on with their day-to-day -day activities. Most mums think second time round they can relax a little bit, but obviously for Kate, having gone through all the severe morning sickness with Prince George and then going through it again with this second pregnancy while having the eyes of the world's press on her, it was probably just as high-octane and, and anxiety-inducing as it was the first time round. It was unusual in the palace announcing that she was pregnant and coinciding that announcement with such detail about her pregnancy that she was 
suffering from acute morning sickness. I suppose there was an option to say that she wasn't feeling very well, but I think they wanted to be completely open and transparent from the start. It came via social media, again another hint at just how modern the monarchy has become. This was an announcement that went viral on Twitter and went viral on Facebook and it came in very quickly on all of our Blackberries and we swung into action. In fact, such was the severity of her morning sickness that Kate reluctantly relinquished her royal duties. There were a handful of events that the Duchess had to miss. There were a few engagements with charities, which the Duchess was really very sad and very disappointed to have missed, but there was just no way that she was going to be able to go. This wasn't just a case of slight nausea. Some of the symptoms of acute morning sickness are throwing up, the vomiting, but there's also the constant nausea. And unfortunately, the vomiting is unprotected. takes them outside of their home environment. It was while I was here at school that I realised my love of sport. Sport has been a huge part of my life. But her love for sport and sporting causes had to take a back seat too and that meant missing the opening of Prince Harry's Invictus Games in the summer of 2014. Yeah, in all seriousness, I hope you know, my sister-in-law gets better, gets better soon. Last time I saw her, she, she was okay, um, feeling, feeling pretty poorly, but I think that's to be expected. Luckily, I'm not a woman, so I don't have to go through that. Yeah, it's a pretty horrible thing to have to go through. She is the person you want on the list when any sporting event's happening for sports aid on the Olympic grounds when she went down three months after giving birth. There she was in these skinny J brand jeans, uh, a striped t-shirt and six inch wedge heels. And she was just giving it a go on the volleyball court and completely fit in. She would have been gutted to miss the Invictus Games. The Royals don't cancel, they never cancel. It's the one thing you can guarantee. So for her to have to pull out of that event, she would have been really upset. In fact, so severe was Kate's morning sickness that she was forced to cancel a trip to Malta with William taking place. And that trip was set to be her most important personal engagement since becoming the Duchess of Cambridge. It wasn't just any overseas trip, it was her first official solo engagement on behalf of the Queen and she was, I was told by a royal source, devastated not to have been able to have gone. The Queen's been pregnant four times, she's had four children, she knows exactly what Kate is going through. We shouldn't sort of decry her because she's been suffering so badly and she's had to miss engagements. I mean, the, the people who were expecting a visit from her are disappointed, yes, uh, and that will be made up to them in the fullness of time, but they're no more disappointed than the Duchess, not being able to fulfil a commitment. I mean, she would have wanted to get back uh, to work, but William, her mum and dad, and the doctors will have uh, said to Kate, you are too tired, you're too exhausted, you're too ill, uh, just rest at home. Although Prince William and indeed brother-in-law Harry stepped in to support Kate, she did return to her husband's side and her own royal duties in October 2014. Kate was out of action in total for about eight weeks. She made her comeback to coincide with the official state visit of the president of Singapore, and that was it. She was back, she looked fantastic, if a little peaky, if I'm being honest. I was there on Horse Guards Parade. She was uh, very smiley, she looked fine, and what was great was the interaction between her and William. They're always trying to get each other uh, to laugh. Coming up, we assess the impact raising two young children will have on Kate and William. For Kate having two babies under two, it is going to be so much hard work. We'll also go back in time for clues as to what kind of life a spare to the air could lead in the future. Queen Elizabeth is set to be the longest reigning monarch in British history, but it's easy to forget that she was never supposed to be queen. Leave London to start a new life. From the moment that William and Kate announced they were getting married, they made no secret of the fact that they couldn't wait to start a family. I think we'll take it one step at a time. We'll sort of get over the marriage thing first and then maybe look at the kids. But uh, obviously, you know, we, we, uh, we want a family. So, um, you know, we'll have to start thinking about that. But with Prince George still a toddler, it came as a surprise to many that they would have a second child so soon. I don't think it was too soon. If you look at their setup, if you look at their dynamic, Prince William's taking on a new job with Air Ambulance. Kate, to me, certainly has really found her feet in her new public role. They've got a beautiful country home. Kensington Palace is refurbished. They've got their team of staff in place. Why wait? It's a perfect opportunity, and I'm told that Kate particularly didn't want there to be a big age gap between the first and second child. That may be so, but for Prince George, his little life is set for a big change. Kate's obviously going to have her hands full with this second baby, but what about little George? He has absolutely been the centre of their world for so long and, of course, being the first grandchild of the Middleton family. So I think, you know, there's going to be every chance he's going to have to take a back seat for a little while when this new baby comes along. And it will, of course, change the dynamics of the family. 
When news broke that baby number two was on its way, there was initially some concern for Kate's physical state, having another child so soon after Prince George. We generally advise women who are fit and well and well nourished that they can consider having a pregnancy um, after six months to a year. But such a close gap between babies will certainly have an effect on Kate and William as parents. So for the next couple of years, Kate and William have totally got their work cut out for them and it will probably seem to them like every time they just get out of one stage, be that sleepless nights or teething, then they're going to have another child going through exactly the same thing. And of course, it's not just going to be with the newborn. Prince George is still very, very young. He's going to be going through the terrible twos. They're going to be dealing with tantrums and all kinds of things. With both William and Kate having siblings so close in age, was it always on the cards they'd follow in their family's footsteps? Well, I was told that Kate particularly wanted there to be a very small gap between George and his sibling. There's only a year between Kate and Pippa and then another year between Pippa and Jane. And similarly, with William and Harry, it's only two years between them. If you look at a royal couple, they tend to have their children close together quite simply so that they have that family time, they have that nesting time, and then they're back at work. And of course, this is no ordinary second born. When Prince George of Cambridge was born on the 22nd of July 2013, another chapter in royal history was made. A new heir to the British throne had arrived. He's absolutely beautiful. They're both doing really well, and we're so thrilled. Oh, it's marvellous. It's absolutely. You'll wait and see. You'll see in a minute. It's got her look, thankfully. No, no, no. <laughs> at him and you know that one day he is going to be king and then you've got the other child who is going to have much less responsibility. Now it could work either way. You could be, you know, very glad that this isn't heaped upon the shoulders of the second child. When Diana was looking after William and, and Harry, she always made it clear to both of them that they were equal, that, that uh, William wasn't different in any way to Harry, even though she did treat him differently. She was far more conscious that he was going to be the future king, far more uh, ready to take him to uh, hospitals, to homeless centres and so on, and allow Harry just to have rather more latitude than his big brother. There was no favouritism at all, and this is why they adored their mother, why they don't have anything bad to say about their mother, and why Diana always referred to them as my boys rather than my boy. But we'll George and his sister be as close, despite their different royal destinies. They will always be treated the same as Prince George, treated with love, treated with kindness, and treated with equality. But the simple fact in history and in the, in the succession is that this child will fall beneath Prince George in that lineage. As a spare heir and fourth in line to the throne, Kate's daughter, Princess Charlotte of Cambridge, is not likely to ever be queen by birthright. But that hasn't always been the case. Over the course of history, the royal uh, spare has been absolutely essential. In order to really be secure as a monarch, you needed to both have both an heir and a spare. This was particularly important at a time when children often didn't live very long, when obviously uh, all kinds of uh, premature deaths and so on could take place. So really, an, an heir and a spare was absolutely crucial. And history has also pointed to a cheekier and more mischievous set of royal secondborns. When you think about people like Prince Harry and Princess Margaret, that there has been sort of fun-loving spirit that has characterised the royal spares in those cases. I think to some extent it's probably personality, uh, but I think also the idea of being, of having the kind of royal privileges in the sense of having uh, a money and access to the sort of social life and experience that those people have, but at the same time not having the responsibility of being a future monarch. I think it's very much genetic, quite frankly, that William is very Hanoverian, he's quite stolid, whereas Harry is very much a Spencer, devil may care, rather reckless, just like his mother. And William is far more dutiful, far more sensible, far more down to earth. Also, it is the way that brothers of that type interact. Research generally suggests that parents do approach things differently with baby number two. They don't have that first-time mum or dad anxiety syndrome. They're generally much more laid back. They will leave the to cry for that little bit longer. They won't be so obsessed with changing a nappy every single hour off into a really false sense of security when they've already had one baby and then there's another one on the way. If they've had a really, really easy time first time round, they normally expect that number two will be the same. Now, obviously, we don't know the intricacies of Prince George's character, but if they have had a really good easy time with him and if he's been a good sleeper, hasn't cried much, they'll probably be expecting the same with their second baby. And who knows, they could be in for a huge shock if number two has a completely different personality.
The bond between siblings can be complicated. Of course, brothers and sisters are likely to be close and look out for one another. But for those siblings raised close in age, hierarchy and a fierce desire to be the most successful often comes hand in hand with their relationship. So what happens when one is destined to be ruler and the other the spare? I suppose if we go right back into the 12th century, we've got the, the rivalry among the sons of Henry II. So Richard the Lionheart, King John, their brother, Prince Henry, who was actually killed in campaign against his brothers. So there was a real rivalry there. William and Harry are huge rivals. I mean, they're on the polo field. It used to drive William mad that Harry, at a younger age, was a better horseman, better shot. And at the same time, Harry always deferred to William because he was the older brother. William and Harry have always had a bond. <laughs> with youngsters, where there is a two-year age difference, they're close almost from the word go because as William grew out of his toys, then Harry would take them over. Um, and as they grew up, they became closer because the age difference was, was only two years. So I think that was one of the contributing factors that made them so close. And of course, the Duchess of Cambridge herself grew up with a sister just 20 months younger than her. So how will her childhood experiences affect the way she approaches being a mother of two under two? They speak every day, they spend a lot of time together, they see each other all the time. Pippa's very involved in George's life. So you've got a really strong sibling link and that is absolutely what Kate will want George to have with his sibling. Still to come, we'll get the inside story behind the big changes for Kate and William as they prepare for a new baby. Kate was having a conversation with the Queen in which she confided that she'd found being with George on her own and not having a full-time nanny or a maternity nurse, very hard work. I think if they still feel under siege at Kensington Palace, we will see them uh, more and more living on the Sandringham Estate at Anne Hall, their very big house in the country that the Queen has given them. Like all parents looking forward to having a second child, Kate and William will no doubt have been agonising over how to raise their growing family and what, if anything, they do differently this time. Parenting is almost like a competitive sport these days. Parents cannot do right for doing wrong. Somebody is always going to be judging you, be that other parent who's got the eyes of the world on you. That pressure must be absolutely magnified a hundred times. So for the next couple of years, Kate and William have totally got their work cut out for them, and it will probably seem to them like every time they just get out of one stage, be that sleepless nights or teething, then they're going to have another child going through exactly the same thing. And, of course, it's not just going to be with the newborn. Prince George is still very, very young. He's going to be going through the terrible twos. They're going to be dealing with tantrums and all kinds of things. <laughs> well, I was told that last Christmas, um, Kate was having a conversation with the Queen in which she confided that she'd found being with George on her own and not having a full-time nanny or a maternity nurse. Very hard work. You remember they went back to the Middletons and, and William and Kate wanted to be hands-on parents. Well, they did it until September and then they recruited a nanny and apparently this time round, one of the first appointments is going to be a maternity nurse. I think despite their good intentions first time round, Kate and William did soon realise that they couldn't hold down their jobs and also care full-time for their child. And I think this time round, perhaps they will cut themselves a little bit of slack and not want to be quite so hands-on as they so desperately wanted to be with baby George, because at the end of the day, they are going to have two children under two and they are going to need help. And like many parents, Kate and William will turn to their families for a helping hand too. Mummy and Daddy Middleton are absolutely crucial to this whole story, going you know, way back ten years and, and all through the courtship of William and Kate. And they are... You know, Carol is very involved in the upbringing of George and looking after her eldest daughter Kate when she was ill again with this extreme uh, morning sickness and for many weeks Kate was at home in Berkshire with mum and dad and grandma Middleton was, was taking up the strain there. I think she's going to want the security of having her mum and dad around but also I think this is all about the normality that she wants for her children as well. One of the things that enables William and Kate to be so ordinary is the presence of the Middletons in their lives. Carol is a regular through those iron gates of Kensington Palace. She whizzes through in her land uh, there's no security because everyone knows her and she turns up to help with bedtime, with bath time. She is absolutely indispensable. Uh, she was from the very start when William and Kate moved into the Middleton's house, the manor, for those early weeks of George's life. And of course, it was to Carol that Kate went when she was so poorly, she didn't want to face the world, she didn't want to be in a palace on her own while William was studying for his new job. She wanted to be with Mum. And I think that's very special. I think it's wonderful that she's been allowed to do it, that the courtiers haven't stood in her way and that she can go home 
not be photographed and actually just be Kate being looked after by mum. Of course, William has only to look back at how Harry and he were raised for some clues on caring for two young royals. William and Harry were raised not like your average child, but they were, they were raised very much in the aristocratic fashion. Prince Charles was a loving but rather distant father. Princess Diana broke with the mould by being Valmoral because she was spending so much time with the, with the children. And she said, you know, why don't you just leave them with the nanny? Prince William is a far more hands-on father at this early stage than Prince Charles was. Prince Charles, like many fathers, aristocratic fathers, came into his own once the boys were old enough to go hunting, shooting and getting on horseback. My guess is that William uh, learnt very much what goes on in the great big wide world by his mother taking him down to the high street, to the movies, to the hamburger joint, to the bookshops, to the clothes shops. So he got a good, good grounding from his mother about the real world. But having said that, he got a good grounding from his father about the real world, but the real world on the other side of the coin, country pursuits, polo, uh, hunting, shooting, fishing. Diana often talked about her craving to be normal. Well, you know, frankly, she shouldn't have married uh, the Prince of Wales. William and Kate aren't normal. They live in palaces. One of the things that William loves about Kate is that you know, the Middletons are normal and it's the closest taste that he's had of, of what other people have, you know, an ordinary day lunch, going to the pub, that sort of thing. But clearly, they're not normal. Uh, one day, they are going to live in a very, very big house and be king and queen. And that quest for normality, to remain as grounded as possible despite their privileged royal status, has seen Kate and William consider a big move away from their London apartment in Kensington Palace. They will move back to their new house in Anmore Hall. So from now on and for the next couple of years, they will be a family of four and they'll be based in Norfolk. I think the move to Norfolk is really important because they do feel... It's a cliché, but they do feel Kensington Palace is this sort of gilded cage. Very, very gilded, but still, there's a limit to what they can do. I know that the one thing that Duke and Duchess really want is to be ordinary. They want to be normal. Behind the walls of Kensington Palace, however, is a team of staff. Their engagements are planned meticulously. Their outfits are planned meticulously. I mean, who else has a valet that lines out what you want to wear every morning? It's not a normal life. Living the extraordinary life that they do guarantees an extraordinary amount of attention, especially from the press. And like his mother, Princess Diana, William is determined to deal with the press coverage of his family on his terms. But despite the couple's best efforts, in October 2014, an incident involving a press photographer and baby George led to William and Kate publicly requesting that their son be left alone feeling about invasion of privacy is, is quite strong, and I, I, I believe it. We don't have privacy laws in the United Kingdom. They have them in other parts of the world. I think when you have a baby being stalked at the age of one, that is obscene. It's really indecent, and quite frankly, the baby and the nanny deserve a certain amount of privacy. There are those who say, well, if they don't like it, go and walk in the garden. It should be seriously wrapped, or, wrapped over the knuckles. The significant change that's happened in the royal family over the last few years has been the fact that Prince William has been far more ready to to law than his father, Prince Charles. And the old adage, never complain, never explain, has now been jettisoned by uh, Prince William. He's far more hands-on, he's far more prepared to come out fighting for his family and for his wife's privacy. They're not going to have intrusion. They're not going to have their child sort of having to stick behind a wall just because there are photographers out there who are greedy. Privacy is very difficult, especially when you go for walks in uh, public parks, and that's part of the tension at the between the royal family and the media, particularly the foreign media, which is printing many more paparazzi shots than the uh, British media is. So the move to Norfolk, the job with the air ambulance, the, the big house on the Sandringham estate that the Queen has uh, gifted to them, and the hall, that's all part of trying to be normal. As Kate and William seek to protect their family's privacy, away from prying eyes, the work of raising two young royals will begin in a time-honoured fashion. History, the royal heir and the spare would have quite different potential uh, programmes of education. Um, and certainly really up until the Renaissance, up until the 16th century, really the, the royal heir was all about uh, training for war, for military successes. And it was really in the 16th century, particularly in the works of the great humanist Erasmus, that the education of a Christian prince became to be seen as very important. First and foremost, we've got a knock-on-the-head change. The royal family don't change. They 
evolve. They've been evolving for a thousand years. We've got a thousand years of history of the British monarchy. You've got to think about how was William brought up? How was Harry brought up? How was Prince of Wales brought up? They'll be brought up in very much, not a controlled atmosphere. There, there'll be a certain amount of things that can be done and can't be done. If you go back to William, when he was old enough, he went to a nursery school in London's Notting Hill Gate, Mrs. Minor's nursery school, after which he then went to Weatherby, which is a primary school in the same area in London's Notting Hill Gate. He then went to Ludgrove, a prep school, and then after that to Eton. So he had a formal education out in the great big wide world. But then his father had the same sort of thing. He didn't go to nursery school, but he went to uh, primary school in London. He went to prep school out in the country at Cheam, and then he went to Gordonston. Quite frankly, I think that the, the model that they will be using will be uh, the Middleton model, which is to say being raised in a very middle-class way, going to private schools and uh, having a degree of latitude in, in the way that they live. Traditionally, royal siblings are treated differently. I always remember being told by a relative of the Queen that Prince William would be treated to tea at Clarence House with the Queen Mother because he was the heir. Same um, treatment all the time as William, so Harry got left out quite a lot of the time. The whole point about William and Harry's upbringing is that William was conscious that he was going to become king, and let's face it, his brother, Harry, was very keen to remind him of that. On one occasion, William said, oh, I want to be a policeman and look after mummy. And Harry said, no, you can't, you've got to be king. Both Prince William and Prince Harry have had very long, successful military careers. Again, they followed in royal footsteps. Charles, Andrew, the Duke of Edinburgh all had military careers, and it's likely that Prince George will too. But actually, if you look at William and Harry's military careers, they've been very different. Prince William, from an early stage, affiliated himself with the RAF. Prince Harry, being the spare, was able to actually get to the front line and he went not once but twice to Afghanistan to fight for his queen and his country. If the guys who are doing the same job as us are being shot at on the ground, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with us being shot at as well. Um, and, yeah, people back home will have issues with that, but we're not special. Um, the guys out there are as simple as that. The heir to the throne, when he's ever been in, in the military, whether it's the, the Duke of Windsor or whether it's Prince Charles, they've always been treated with kid gloves. William was genuinely angry that he wasn't allowed to serve in Afghanistan and um, Harry, as the spare, uh, was allowed to go. Uh, William genuinely thought, you know, I, I, I can go there, I should be able to go there, but he's just too close to the throne. There is a bit of jealousy, not just the fact that I get to fly this, but obviously he'd love to be out here, and I don't see why, to be honest with you, I don't see why he couldn't. William's desire to lead a normal life does have its limitations, but for Harry, the birth of baby number two gives him even more freedom. Now he lives his life. And of course, with that growing family, your prospects of becoming king reduced, don't they? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Harry genuinely is delighted that he's moving down the batting order. He can see what the pressure, the expectation, the waiting does to people. He's seen it with his father. He's seeing it now with uh, William, who you know does have a heavier burden on his shoulders, destiny or history or whatever you want to call it. Harry doesn't have that. I think William's come to terms with it now, and he feels he can you know make his own space and do his, his own thing. Harry, of course, has got much more freedom to do that. But if history has shown us anything, it's that royal futures are never set in stone. In the past, if you think about Prince Arthur, the oldest son of Henry VII, he dies, and actually it's his brother, the much more charismatic Henry VIII, who uh, succeeds him, and who, of course, isn't supposed to have been king again, but, of course, had a huge impact on history. I mean, one of, is one of the most sort of infamous monarchs. Royal history isn't always set in stone. Things don't always work out how they're expected to. When Edward VIII abdicated, his brother found himself in an unprecedented and very unexpected position, and that position was quite simply he would be the next King of England. Both Elizabeths, Victoria, Henry VIII, none of them were meant to uh, take the throne. They were all way down the line of succession, but then fate played its hand. Coming up, we look at who the big money winners are likely to be from the birth of baby number two. In our case, she was placing the order pretty much like a regular customer except the delivery address was Kensington Palace, <laughs> which was quite exciting. In stores, we were getting calls from all over the world, even from, like, Spain, Japan, everywhere. And we'll get the inside track on the birth that kept everyone waiting. With William and her charismatic brother-in-law, Harry, by her side, Kate has been credited with helping to make the British royal family accessible and relevant again. So it's no surprise that since she became the Duchess 
Cambridge, the world has literally been buying into Kate Middleton. We all know that Kate loves the high street fashion brands, and one of them in particular is Reese. And since we've seen her wearing so much Reese, that's actually contributed to them opening across the US. I think we've seen it time and time again that Kate's fashion sells out in seconds. The blue and white wrap dress that she wore in Australia sold out in eight minutes. I think no matter where you are in the world, uh, you are definitely looking out for Kate. You want to know what she's wearing, where she bought it from, and if in fact you can get your hands on it. Coming from Canada, I know that blog posts to magazines, anywhere you can kind of find that information, they'll be letting you know what Kate wore most recently and giving you examples of where you can find it. Kate's clothes, of course, are always of interest, and she does the yummy mummy look very, very well. When she's off duty, we're used to seeing her in her skinny jeans and her little pumps and sweaters, and that's a look that everybody can copy and everybody can emulate, and again, that, that's part of her huge appeal. All eyes in the fashion industry from the stylists to the brands to the people that are getting on the websites to pick up these items they're just watching what Kate is putting baby George in and what number two is going to be wearing because that's what people want to get their hands on that's what brands want to be selling and that's what stylists want to be creating what's been really interesting is the outfits that she's worn in her early pregnancy have been far racier than anything she wore when she was pregnant with Prince George we've seen shorter hemlines we've seen splashes of color we've seen lower necklines quite daring outfits for a pregnant and I think that's great. And one designer in particular has really benefited from Kate's maternity choices. We can't approach her. I think that's a little bit the etiquette because um, so you have to wait to be chosen. And in our case, she was placing the order pretty much like a regular customer, except the delivery address was Kensington Palace, <laughs> which was quite exciting. It really opens up for us the American market, uh, which uh, is notoriously difficult to get into. We have also opened up distribution in Japan, in China, so, you know, areas um, where it's quite hard to ping on our doors. I think she is playing a fantastic role at promoting British fashion um, from the brand's point of view, but also she's kind of raised the antis in terms of the elegance because she is so elegant. I think she's kind of pushed a lot of the average people to think, I need to be as elegant as her. But it's not just Kate's clothes that are watched by royal fans across the globe. When Kate and William went to Australia and New Zealand on their first these trip together as a family, it was baby George who stole the show. That outing cemented their position as a trend-setting all-star family, with George's presence in particular giving baby fashion and retail brands a welcome boost in sales. I think the appeal with baby George is that when we look at his outfits, although he's dressed in a kind of traditional royal baby way, he's also really, really accessible. So we can look at his little shirt and his little blue shorts and we know we can buy something very, very similar. This is a similar jumper to the one that we made for George. Obviously, this is for a little boy called Jack. We were very surprised at the interest and how many people actually wanted to get hold of something very similar to what George was wearing. We saw an immediate increase in interest in the brand right from that very day onwards. We almost couldn't believe it when we saw that he was wearing the shoes. Then we felt really excited and it was a huge buzz all around all of the shops. So all of us were so excited and we thought, oh my goodness, the actual future King of England's wearing the shoes from us. We couldn't actually keep up with demands at first. We sold out almost immediately online once he was pictured wearing it. In stores, we were getting calls from all over the world, even from like Spain, Japan, everywhere. With maternity brands cashing in on Kate's latest style choices and older brother George already a trend-setting toddler, the fashion business is set for an even bigger boost with the arrival of Princess Charlotte. Historically, royal princesses are far more interesting to the public than royal boys and royal princes. And you saw that with the birth of Princess Elizabeth, the Queen Mum's first daughter and the present Queen. So she was the most talked about and uh, watched little girl in her time. And that's years before the internet, years before social media, years before Twitter. Now all eyes are on Her Royal Highness Princess Charlotte of Cambridge. Born on May the 2nd, 2015, a little later than everyone had expected. Witnessing events unfold at the Lindo Wing was Royal Reporter Simon... Well, the only guidance we got was from the Duchess herself, who said mid to late April. Fleet Street tied itself up in knots over April the 25th, April the 27th. Is she one week overdue, ten days overdue? We simply don't know, and we may never know, but she seemed to cope pretty well to me. Some of the royal superfans who are always front and centre of the queue for weddings and births and great occasions, they have been here because they know it's the best way of getting a good position, and actually they, some of them have a, a personal sort of relationship 
Both for them, but they're absolutely royal super fans, and they turn out come come rain or shine. Let's go! Kay gave birth at half past eight, just two two and a half hours after arriving here at uh, the Lindo Wing. So it was fast work. The announcement was made uh, before midday, so everything progressed very quickly during the day. They announced it uh, three ways. There was an official email to royal correspondents like me. That was about half past six in the morning. There was also the official tweets. They're very hot on social media. And then the ceremonial easel, the, the usual old way of announcing a princely or princessly birth at Buckingham Palace. We welcome with humble duty the second born of the Royal Highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. The only visitor uh, to William and Kate and the new princess was George, who isn't uh, yet two years old, but uh, he stole everybody's hearts again. We haven't seen him for a long time uh, as his father went back to Kensington Palace and brought him back uh, here to the uh, Lindo Wing. Uh, William wanted George to walk, but uh, George didn't want to do that, so William picked him up. There are a couple of royal waves, a kiss uh, from father and then into the door. Uh, behind me. It was a lovely moment. He, he looked smashing and uh, he stole quite a few hearts. But with the move to Anne Hall, will the Middletons play as big a role with Princess Charlotte as they did with Prince George? Carol Middleton absolutely front and centre on this one. She's helped Kate with George a great deal. She's helped decorate and renovate Anne Hall where they're going to be living in Norfolk for much of the time. So uh, Granny Middleton is very important in all of this. Kate's daughter will undoubtedly have more freedom than her brother, Prince George, but as a spare heir, she will still have an important role to play. The job of the royal child, with a, an elder brother or sister, is to be supportive. So the Prince of Wales, later the Duke of Windsor, was always supported by his sister and his three brothers. Elizabeth, now the Queen, was always supported by Princess Margaret. So there is a kind of unwritten code inside the royal family that your job as a sibling is to help share the burden of uh, monarchy. So how will Kate and William's thoroughly modern style of parenting help to push the boundaries of what it means to be a family unit in a royal household? I think how Princess Diana brought up her boys has quite obviously had a huge long-term effect on Prince William. And I think that probably has really, really geared William up to do very much the same sort of thing. We probably won't ever hear about it. We will hopefully never see the pictures of this private family time. But I'm quite certain that Prince William will be doing all those sorts of things, totally under the radar, just like his mum did, to ensure that his children have a relatively normal upbringing, a normal childhood. What are we going to see of the younger royals in the next few years? Well, we'll see more of William and Kate and Harry as they take on more official royal duties. I don't think necessarily we're going to see more of Prince George and Kate, that he will protect his children. And I don't think we'll see that much of the royal children. And so William and Kate and their children we can look at as this kind of great showbiz couple with something a bit special. Um, but in time I think it's going to be interesting how it's going to play out and if, if they're going to become uh, ultimately uh, king and queen it's going to be a very different kind of monarchy than it is now. We see a new chapter beginning for the Cambridges, an exciting chapter, a new family chapter and I think they're probably going to be incredibly happy. In the last five years, Kate has gone from being a single young woman to the wife of the future king and mother of two royal heirs to the throne. With Kate, very quickly, once she moved into the royal family and she established her own style and own personality, comparisons with Diana fell away. You've got to stand back and admire her for what she's achieved without any fuss, without any tantrums, without any breakdowns. It has been a whirlwind for Kate, but she has taken on more and more, and she can do it. She's, you know, she's a natural at doing it. And although Princess Charlotte is not likely ever to have as important a royal role as her older brother Prince George, she will mean the world to Kate, whose own role as mum and royal matriarch will be crucial in helping to redefine the British monarchy in the 21st century, cementing their place as the world's most famous of families for many years to come.